guys, my name is Andy. I'll be showing you around the farm today. Um, at the farm, I'm our tourist program lead, and then I'm also a farm and hatchery tech. So I'm just helping keep the animals happy and healthy throughout the week. And then on Saturdays and whenever schools are here giving tours. Um, throughout our tour, just make sure you watch your step. Um, everything's an uneven terrain or a working farm. Um, today there's kelp, so there's a lot of people walking around with wheelbarrows and just filled with kelp. So just pay attention. Um, and then throughout our tour, we're gonna follow the entire life cycle of the abalone from, we have one day old abalone that just hatched um, all the way up to adults that are ready to be sold. Um, so we'll follow that whole process, but we'll also hit on some conservation efforts we're a part of and some land use history here at the farm. So with that, we can kind of get started. Um, the building you guys were just at is our, what we call our Christmas tree house. Um, we turned it into our little tour store, but most recently before the abalone farm was here, this land was a Christmas tree farm. So this kiosk just kind of one of the last remainders from that. You can see what the Christmas tree prices were in the eighties. Um, it was a cut your own farm for Monterey Pines, which is kind of a weird Christmas tree to begin with, but pretty cool nonetheless. Um, the farm has been here since 1992 and it started in 1989 in someone's backyard in Goleta. Um, so it was a pretty small operation before it moved out here. And this land has been home to a lot of different um, farming efforts and just different perspectives on how to use the land. The first people that used this land were the Chumash and um, the geography of it allowed for two distinct groups to live here. And they didn't get along too well. So what they did is they used this main stream on our property as a dividing boundary. One group lived on the bluff side to your right, the other on the bluff side to your left. And then they both foraged at the beach um, for a variety of seafoods. Um, they used abalone for meat, but interestingly, they also used abalone to make fishing hooks um, from the shells. And those were really well suited to catch the local fish when Europeans came and tried to show them their cool, fancy European fish hooks. They realized they weren't as effective as the ones that Chumash were using here. Um, it's pretty cool knowing how to use your resources and catch the local species. Uh, in this late 1500s, Juan Cabrillo came and noticed the two distinct groups of people. And so he named this area Dos Pueblos, meaning two villages. After that, the Spanish didn't take control of the land until the 1700s. And when they did that, their justification was they didn't want the Russian fur traders to take it. So they took it, <laughs> um, kind of interesting. But they didn't use the land until the 1850s when it was given as a land grant to an Irishman named Juan Cabrillo. No, not Juan Cabrillo. The Irishman is Nicholas Den. Um, morning tours are new. Uh, <laughs> Nicholas Den came here because he was almost a doctor and Santa Barbara didn't have a doctor at the time. Um, so he was almost a doctor because he had studied medicine for most of the years, but on his last year before he could graduate, his family lost their fortune. And so he couldn't finish school. So he shipped out here and was a doctor for a little bit, but then eventually decided he wanted to be a cowboy. Um, so he worked up in Carpinteria and then set his sights on owning this ranch. And when he lived here, what he did was raise cattle and then he would um, drive them up to San Francisco to sell them to gold miners. So here he could get $5 a head for a cow. In San Francisco, he could get 50. Uh, so it was worth the trip. Um, after him, a man named John Williams bought the land from one of his descendants. And his idea was just to turn this into a big resort. Um, he reminded it, he thought it reminded him of Naples in Italy. So he called this place Naples by the sea. Um, and this whole idea was based on the train getting this far south, but there was issues with the train. It stopped getting built. And so it was never realized during his lifetime. So he just kind of had a little resort all to himself here. Everyone's favorite sign, it's pretty cool. That's the old logo, um, the little abalone shells on the bottom. For I forget who was asking. <laughs> this is a, our second stream on property. This one's ephemeral, so we only get water during the winter. Um, the larger streams on the other side of the property. That was the old logo. That you yeah. <laughs> it's pretty. It was cool. Yeah. Um, after him, Sam Mosher started the orchid industry here. Um, it's not the best place to grow orchids, but he was just really passionate about it. So during his time, 
Dude, the vultures have been so cool. They fly really low. Um, so during his time, through his passion for orchids, he made Santa Barbara the biggest place for orchid growing. But once he moved the operation to Hawaii, that became the biggest place. We did a lot of cool birds. They were taking top I don't think so. I think like some raccoons and rats maybe get up in there. Definitely raccoons. <laughs> Probably skunks too. We've had a skunk issue the past couple days. <laughs> uh, you'll just catch wafts of it <laughs> somewhere. Uh, as far as the abalone farm, like I said, it's been around for 35 years. Um, starting in the late 80s, because that's when we finally knew how to reproduce abalone in captivity. So there was a big boom in abalone farms across the state because there was also a lot of concern around changing legislation. Am I going to be able to fish for abalone anymore or do I need another way to get those? So there were about 30 farms at that time in California and now we're down to just three. So big change in production. Um, we're going to head up to your left first and check out our head tanks and our hatchery. And then we'll head to this other side and look at our larger 